screen. Um, the title of the talk is Trusted CDNs Without Gatekeepers. So I'll be talking about Web3, blockchain. No, I'm not. No, there's not going to be any, any mention of blockchain. Um, so uh, Trusted CDNs Without uh, Gatekeepers. Uh, who am I? Uh, my name is uh, Michał Ryszek Woźniak. Um, uh, over the years, I've, uh, I've been uh, on all the different sides of, of tech and internet. I've been an activist. I've been on the policy side uh, somewhat. I've been, uh, I handled tech support and information security for uh, journalists and other at-risk individuals. Um, and I managed infrastructure, and now I'm dabbling a little bit in, 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 journalism, in tech journalism myself. But for the, for the specific... Um, uh, uh, for this specific talk, what is what is probably most important is that I, I've been a uh, um, chief information security officer and head of infrastructure at OCCRP. Anybody remembers OCCRP? Um, the Panama Papers says more. Yeah, there we go. That's yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, not surprisingly, websites hosted by OCCRP uh, tended to have very little traffic, and then suddenly, very, very, very much traffic. Uh, so that was an interesting, uh, interesting thing that got me thinking about um, how how can we make w websites resilient? How can we make websites, you know, stay up and running without relying on things like you know Cloudflare? Uh, because fuck Cloudflare. Um, uh, so um, I've given a talk two years ago at Hope 2020 called C Censorship is no longer an, uh, interpreted as, uh, as damage. And what I said in this talk, uh, are you looking at the screens? Is it, is it visible? Okay, so because there's going to be information on the, on the slides, but I will be also trying to say it all out loud. So in that talk, I covered... Um, the first part, let's let's say, of, of making websites resilient, and, uh, and or, or my my idea of making websites resilient, and that was a uh, focused on sane website setup, uh, right? Don't have a WordPress with 50 plugins because that will make you cry, and this will make your server cry, and this will make your visitors cry. Uh, caching and microcaching, static site generators, uh, and coping with downtime when, when that happens. So I would implore you to watch that talk at some point, but it's not necessary to have, wa have watched that talk to, uh, to be able to uh, uh, follow this talk, uh, but it's, it, it might be useful uh, on, its, um, on its own. Some of the things I will repeat a little bit uh, from that talk here because they are relevant. So, uh, anybody here runs a website that every now and then gets a bit of traffic that makes the server go like, yeah, okay. So, uh, my takeaway from, from doing this and, and, and having dealt with downtime and all of that is that whatever it is, it is almost certainly not a DDoS. Uh, you are almost certainly not dealing with a DDoS. Your website is down not because of a DDoS. It is almost certainly down because it's probably just organic traffic that is hitting your, uh, your dynamic CMS. Uh, is, uh, is the term dynamic CMS understandable? I assume it is, right? So it's things like WordPress, right? Data is in, the, in a database somewhere. Then there's a bunch of code. And for every request, roughly, uh, you get the data gets pulled from the database. You know, HTML gets rendered push to the user, right? That's a lot of work. Um, and, and this means that, uh, there's, uh, that you would be amazed how few uh, requests per second a standard WordPress site can handle, right? Unless you, you're, you're doing some fancy stuff like microcaching. But then, of course, there are the plugins uh, for CMSs. And I'm focusing on WordPress because it's the most popular one, and, and also it gave me the most grief. Uh, but things like over 90, uh, 90 WordPress themes, plugins, uh, backdoored in supply chain attack, right? Uh, yes, that's, that's what happens because you have a plugin that somebody wrote five years ago and then stopped, uh, you know, uh, updating, uh, and there's a bug. Or somebody sold the plugin to some other company that said, hey, we're going to buy and support your plugin. Here's some money. Thank you. And now they have supply chain attack against any website using the plugin. Great, right? Uh, but thankfully, you would not believe there are plugins for fixing compromised WordPress websites. Don't. <laughs> this is not the solution, right? Uh, just make regular uh, tested backups. Um, another way of dealing with, uh, with uh, let's say, 
uh, website downtime mainly when, when it's related to censorship, right? Mainly when there are some uh, bad people on the internet somewhere that decide, you know what, people should not see your website. We don't, li we don't like your website and nobody should like your website. Nobody should, she should, should see your website. Is, you know, Tor, I2P, these kinds, of, uh, these kinds of tools that give people like us access to websites that other people don't want us to have access to, right? The problem with these tools, these are, these are amazing tools, and I love them uh, fondly, and I use them all the time. The problem with them from the perspective of a person running a popular-ish news website is that it is uh, unreasonable to expect that the population of a whole country switches to Tor browser just to keep seeing your website. That's not going to happen. There's going to be a, you know, a bunch of people who will, who will do this, and I strongly, strongly implore you to have an you know, um, onion hidden service for your, for your website. That's always a good idea. Just, just do it. It's really not that much work. Uh, but uh, but uh, making sure that your website is available in places where it might be censored is not a Tor-shaped problem. Tor-shaped problem is I want to have access to a website that is censored. It's not... I want my website to be accessible to everyone uh, for whom it is censored, right? It's just the other side of the coin. Um, uh, so yeah, like website visitors, your website visitors will not switch to, to, to those tools uh, en masse. And the same goes for Brave, same goes for changing DNS settings, all of this. We've seen situations where changing DNS settings did happen en masse, right? But that is not something you can really expect and rely on if you're running a website uh, that you want to stay up uh, in places like, I don't know, Azerbaijan, right? Um, so, uh, then, you know, the, the, the standard response is, well, you can always use Cloudflare, right? Cloudflare is great. Uh, <coughs> and uh, apparently about like 19% 19 of all websites think that this is a good solution. And just by the, by the virtue of that number, that tells me that this is not a good solution, right? It's like centralizing things, giving 20%, almost 20% of all websites to be controlled and man in the middle by, by a single company. Yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think that's a great solution. I'm, I'm sure that Cloudflare service is, is, is great, but it's, it's just, it, does, it strikes me as a little bit um, uh, odd, especially that uh, those, those companies will drop your site like a hot potato if it's just inconvenient for them to continue hosting your site. Um, and as, as the CEO of Cloudflare said right after they took down Daily Stormer, um, yeah, a small number of companies will largely determine what can and cannot be online. And as much as, as I am the, on the polar opposite of political spectrum as the, from the Daily Stormer, uh, I also find this disturbing, right? This is too much power for a private company to be able to say, we have, you know, almost 20% websites of like all of the whole internet. Uh, we can just decide which ones stay up and which, which go down. That's great, right? Um, so uh, we will have a talk. Uh, hands up who will have a talk with me. Boom, these guys. Uh, in two hours at 4 p.m. in Envelope, uh, um, uh, not talk, sorry, workshop, on making sense of social media freedom, speech, uh, freedom of speech and fascists. And I do have opinions on the Delhi Stormer situation, but this talk is not about that. The workshop will be more about that. So if, if, if you want to have this conversation, let's have it there. Um, uh, today, yeah, 4 p.m. Envelope. Uh, and so, but the problem with centralizing, uh, uh, um, like putting all of our eggs in, in those few, few baskets like Amazon AWS, uh, Cloudflare, Fastly, Akamai, these guys, right? It's not just that, they, that the decision that they might make, right? It's not just like, oh, we don't like this website, we're going to take you down, because they're too big an operation to really care about most of those websites. Uh, but the bigger, the bigger problem is also that all of those companies, um, tend to go down on a regular basis? Have you noticed this? Like, so, uh, Fastly outage, June 20, uh, 22nd, 2021. Akamai uh, major outage uh, due to DNS bugs. Uh, it's never, it cannot be DNS, it's never DNS. It was DNS, uh, July 23rd last year. Uh, then Amazon Web Services, uh, third outage in a month, uh, December 22nd last year. And Cloudflare outage, uh, June 21st, uh, today, right? If you, have, if you happen to use all four of them, 
right? And I have seen websites that use all four of them for some inexplicable reason, because it's just easier to, you know, uh, uh, hotlink a, a piece of JavaScript from Fastly, and, you know, you have some of your content on Akamai, and then you have some, your website is behind Cloudflare, and then there's something on CloudFront because somebody put it there, and uh, what are you, what are you going to do, right? Now you have all of those four companies, all of their infrastructure has to stay up for your website to stay up. And over the last year, more than four times they went down, right? So now you quadrupled your chance that your website will be down. And, um, uh, it, yeah, it, 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 and there's nothing really you can do once, once, once a down, uh, like, uh, an outage like this hits, right? Because you don't know how long it will be. You don't know how much energy you can um, uh, invest into this. And because maybe they will be up in five minutes or, you know, three hours. Or it's a Facebook-shaped uh, 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 screw-up and, you know... How long is it? The eight hours of global outage? That was fascinating. Uh, anyway, uh, the point is, people make mistakes. Yes, people make mistakes. There should be a K there. Uh, software has bugs, and hardware fails, and monocultures are not resilient, right? Uh, if you have if you have plenty of small companies that handle a small part of, of the uh, internet infrastructure, then any single one of them going down is not that much of a deal, right? A, a, a person making a mistake at like a small provider somewhere, yes, some users will lose access to their internet or some websites will go down, but it's not 20% of the internet going down because somebody made a mistake or some software had a bug, right? Where you put all your eggs in, in, in those few huge, gigantic, uh, enormous, uh, galaxy-sized baskets, then a, a, a Proper, proper bug, proper, uh, correct, uh, correctly placed uh, mistake uh, will take 20% of the internet down. And that's kind of, you know, not really okay. Uh, and then who here uses Cloudflare? Yes. So if something goes pear-shaped, uh, really pear-shaped, uh, switching from Cloudflare to, like, to get your website off of Cloudflare can take up to 48 hours, right? Because you have to make, you have to move the NS records, you have to move the name servers somewhere else, and TTL on those is usually 24 hours, uh, and then caching. So now you have, now you, now you have to make a decision: Do you wait for Cloudflare to go up, or you wait 48 hours for your website to, you know, start uh, start working again? This is this is I find that problematic, right? On the other hand, of course, it would be quite unreasonable to expect that every news website or investigative journalism outlet or, or you know, human rights organization would roll uh, out uh, their own self-hosted infrastructure that would be the size of Cloudflare so that it, would, uh, it could uh, ingest uh, or, or handle huge spikes of traffic and gigantic DDoSs and all of that. That's not going to happen, right? Those organizations are sadly extremely underfunded. They're running on shoestring uh, uh, budgets. If there are any founders, uh, founders here, please, by all means, fund those organizations more, especially their, their tech departments. They really, really need this. And funding tech, uh, the, like infrastructure in those organizations and information security in those organizations somehow is not considered sexy, whatever that means. Uh, please reconsider if, if, uh, uh, if you have the, the power to fund those organizations a little bit better. But yes, infrastructure is, in, uh, is expensive, and uh, no single organization will be able to you know, deploy a large enough infrastructure to, to be able to withstand huge spikes of traffic on their own. This is just not, not, not going to happen, hence we have Cloudflares and Akamai's of this world. But maybe those costs could be shared. Maybe we could pool those resources, right? Maybe we could have multiple organizations saying, look, we have an infrastructure. Usually our traffic is, you know, let's say 10% of our, of our capacity, right? Uh, so we have 90% margin in case our traffic goes up. Let's say we have 10 of those organizations pooling resources and saying, so now we suddenly have access to the bandwidth of all of those organizations. If shit hits the fan on our website, we can rely on this bandwidth, right? Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of the idea that I have, of, of trying to create a, a piece of software that would allow us to build a community CDN that multiple organizations could come together and say, you know, use, we're using this software on our website, and if, if our website goes, you know, if, if our infrastructure goes down, the website will continue to stay up thanks to the other organizations in our little cluster, in our little community, right? And the way it would have to work is uh, pooling uh, the infrastructure and resources of multiple organizations, uh, and originally no new infrastructure uh, 
uh, investment should be necessary, right? Because that's not going to happen. You're not going to convince, uh, you know, 10 NGOs like, hey, how about you invest a lot into this shiny new thing to build this whole new infrastructure? That's not going to happen, right? So this has to work on the infrastructure they, al they already have if they're self-hosting, right? Uh, there has to be minimal organizational overhead, no new entity or organization or anything like that that needs to be set up and saying, okay, we're going to, you know, set up a new organization, put all of our infrastructure budget in that organization, and that will so, uh, like, uh, handle the infrastructure needs for all of those organizations, the cluster. That's not going to happen because that's too much organizational overhead, right? Those organizations will not agree uh, to, to, to do this because it also gives away a little bit of, of power, it also gives away a little bit of, of control, and that's kind of like mm, uh, difficult. Uh, this, uh, the thing that I'm thinking about, and I will start describing it in a moment, uh, would kick in only when a site, the site is down. The reason why I think this is a good thing, and not everyone might, might agree, the reason why I think it is a good thing is because you can tell all of those, let's say, 10 organizations, look, we're building this cluster, this magical community CDN cluster thing, uh, but until the websites are running fine, you will not have any new bandwidth costs. Right? No, random band, no, no random requests will start hitting your infrastructure immediately. It's only where some, when something is actually happening uh, with, with website of one of those organizations where, when, when the bandwidth of other organizations is starting to be used. Right? Uh, no uh, TLS private keys shared and no other kind of uh, benevolent monster in the middle situation. Right? If you're using Cloudflare, Cloudflare sits like uh, terminates your TLS. Uh, so it, it can technically see uh, your traffic and, and all of this. This is not something that I would be okay with, and, and many organizations that I'm thinking about of like suggesting that they should use this kind of approach would also not be okay with, um, which is one of the reasons why some of those organizations are just not using Cloudflare. Uh, so I also want to avoid this uh, monster in the middle situation. Uh, and it absolutely has to be transparent for visitors in the sense of no, no uh, special software or special setup needed on the part of visitors, right? A person who had been visiting your website, should, for them, the website should just work, even if it doesn't. Uh, I know it sounds weird, but trust me, we're, we're going to get there, right? Uh, and the reason why this is important is what I said before, right? Millions of people in the country will not download the Tor browser. Millions of people in the country will not download your special Snowflake solution to whatever problem you're trying to, so to solve. You have to, like, my, my, uh, my aim is to try to figure out a way uh, such that uh, uh, visitors don't have to do anything. Right? Website admins deploy this, and visitors like, okay, yeah, it works. Oh, it works a little bit slower. I wonder what's happening. What's happening is your website is down, and now it's pulling content from somewhere else. But the visitors are like, yeah, okay, that just works, fine. Um, there are uh, quite a few assumptions here, uh, so this will not work for certain situations. One of the assumptions is that the visitors must be using modern mainstream browsers because uh, I'll, I'll, I'm relying heavily on uh, modern you know, web I APIs and, and stuff. I will explain in a moment. And JavaScript has to be enabled, so again, not everyone uh, not everyone will be happy, right? That's why I said run an onion, uh, onion hidden service for everyone who is not happy with this setup, because they will probably have a Tor browser already, and they will be very happy to use it, right? Um, uh, as I do. Uh, this, uh, the solution that I'll be talking about is not going to work for massively dynamic web applications. Think, think Facebook or, or, or Twitter-like, Twitter-shaped things, right? Where the content just flows constantly and, and all of that, right? <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is more, I'm focusing more on somewhat static sites, think news sites, right? There, where there's a bit of content published every now and then, and every now and then, of course, can be, uh, can be quite frequently. It can be, you know, many times a day or many times an hour. But the, the let's say, <sighs> the shape of content is kind of like, uh, uh, it can be approximated by a static site. Right? It can still be a dynamic site, it can still you know, do dynamic things, but you, you should be able to cache a piece of content right? as a, let's say, HTML, HTML file or statify the site somehow. Right? Um, so, so, yeah, uh, obviously this has to work with any, any content type, but currently huge files are tricky uh, for reasons that might become obvious in a moment. Uh, and video streaming is really not a thing with, uh, with, uh, with what I'm building, uh, because I have to somehow limit the, the scope, 
right? There's uh, trying to do everything at the same time is going to be uh, difficult. And finally, and I promise this is the sli last slide about assumptions. Uh, it is not meant for sensitive content. Uh, this 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 tool is meant for. The point of this tool is keeping public content online. It's not about, you know, distributing sensitive content. If you need this kind of stuff, again, hidden onion services, like authorized hidden onion services, there's plenty of tools for, for, for that kind of thing. And it's not meant for, your, um, for any after login area of the website. So it's not meant to uh, keep your admin interface running. It is meant to keep your public site running. If like solutions for keeping the web, uh, admin interface running can be different or you can have a special VPN or you know all, all, all of these things and I'm happy to talk about this uh, you know after the after the talk with with you if you if you would like to to hear my my thoughts about this uh, but this specifically focuses on the public side like a public uh, public content on your uh, on your website, uh, and th 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 splitting it this way also, I feel, has security benefits, right? Because if you if you split it this way, your public site is public, right? But has no way of interfacing with the with the uh, admin uh, uh, interface. That means that you know a script kitty will not use a, a WordPress bug to to take over your site, right? Uh, but that's somewhat beside the point. Okay. Uh, I mentioned sane setup, um, and, and I will just go quickly through this. What this means to me, as I mentioned, is limiting pl plugins and complexity. Um, static site generators, if it's something that can work for you, I would strongly recommend this if you want your, your, your website to be you know, uh, um, resilient to reasonably high traffic. Caching and micro-caching, I'm happy to talk about this uh, with, with whoever wants to talk about this after the, after the talk, because that's a whole separate ball of uh, hairy things. Um, and, uh, and that's something I see in a lot of websites, that they, uh, like, they configure their whatever, WordPress or, or, or whatever CMS they're running, ha they hard-code the domain. Right? Which means if you're a small news organization somewhere in Caucasus or, 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 or the Balkans, and you get blocked for whatever reason, Usually the easiest thing that comes to your mind is, oh, we can just get a new domain and put our website on that domain, right? Send this to our uh, users. Oh, shit, we cannot because the CMS enforces the old domain. <laughs> And now you have a bigger problem, right? So thinking about this, uh, this is something that I haven't noticed that many people think about. Thinking about this when you set up the website is really important and just say, you know what? I don't need to have the domain hard-coded. I don't, I, I really, relative links are fine, right? And that also means that if you move to a different domain, your website will still work, right? Which, yay. Um, okay, uh, so. Let's get to the interesting things. When the site goes down, right? We have a, we have a, you have a news website. The, the website goes down. Let's say it's blocked because something. Uh, um, and uh, when this happens, you, are, you have a chicken and egg problem, right? Let's say you set up a separate domain. Your website was you know, sane. Uh, it works on the separate domain. How do you put this information out to the users, right? The best way to inform your visitors that there's a new domain would be to use your website, but your website is down. Kind of difficult, right? So you can use social media, you can use all those things, but uh, for a lot of users, the default place that they visit to get information from your website or about your website is your website. So, eh, chicken and egg. Uh, but we can try to fix this with service workers. Anyone is familiar with service workers? Okay, so service workers, uh, are this uh, is this uh, web ap uh, API that is relatively new? I would say five years ish, maybe in 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 production state. And the idea is, website uh, sends a piece of code and tells the browser when when the visitor visits the website, hey, from this point on, this bit of code ha handles all of the requests that are done in the context of this website, all of them. Right? So all of the requests to the domain and all of the requests that, in, uh, that originate from the loaded page to any domain. Right? Uh, and this piece of code gets cached. And this piece of code, the browser then remembers uh, such that even if you close all the tabs, close the browser, all of this, uh, you, three weeks later, you visit the site. And what happens is that this code is brought up from the cache, handles your requests. 
right? What this means is we can do reasonably um, interesting things. Because, yeah, as I said, uh, once registered, the service worker kicks in the moment a request is fired, including before the website is loaded, as long as the service worker had been loaded before, right? So for anyone who had visited your site once, this code is there. It's already cached, it's going to run, it's going to be there for, for a month or longer, um, and it will handle all the requests, right? So this allows us to, you know, obviously cache the content in browser, just say, you know, if you pull this content, cache it, and the next time the user loads this page, if the page is not working, just show the cached content. But that's boring, right? There are plenty of people are do doing that already, and that's kind of boring. But you can do what you can also do uh, is um, you can pull the content from anywhere else. This is your code. You can just do fetch requests anywhere else. Right? You can do alternative endpoints, meaning. Your website is down. A returning visitor comes to your website, right? Uh, service worker gets, gets spun up. And the service worker says, uh, hold on, the website is not, is not responding. But I know that I can get this content also from these secondary domains. So I'm just going to pull this content from secondary domains. Boom. From the perspective of the user, the website just works. It's maybe a little bit slower because it has to first figure out that the fetch request to the original website doesn't work. But for, like, OK half a second longer. Oh, no, right? Uh, so this is, this is uh, what I I've been working as, as a project called LibResilient. And maybe you can even see the URL there, resilient.is. Um, and what it does is it, it, impl it implements all of the above. Right? It implements the service work. It implements the plugins for you know, caching and pulling content from random places. Um, and uh, it has a configurable order of operations, uh, which means we can do something like this. Right? We can say, hey, once, when you get a request for content related to this website and coming from the domain of this website, please first fetch to the, from the original domain. Right? If that works, great. Just cache that content. Provided to the user, we're done. But if the if the fetch doesn't work because the, let's say the backend domain, the, the original domain is down, okay, do we have it in cache? Maybe we do. Great. Maybe we don't. What do we do? We do. We go to alternative endpoints, right? We we say, hey, okay, fetch didn't work. We didn't have it in cache, uh, but I know that this content should be available in these five different endpoints. So I'm going to just pull it, uh, plume it from, uh, pull pull it from there, right? And whichever succeeds first, uh, the first successful remote fetch gets cached. And boom, the user now has access to this uh, content. And again, it just works. The, 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 the visitor has no clue what, what was happening uh, behind the scenes. And for example, just, just to throw it out there, possible alternative endpoints, you know, Wayback Machine, right? If, you, if your website is on Wayback Machine, boom, you have an alternative endpoint for free. You can literally just fetch your content from Wayback Machine. Great, right? Uh, you can have uh, um, public folders on, on major cloud services. They will hate you for this. You know, one little trick to make cloud services hate you. Uh, but it would work, right? You just fetch from the public, uh, public folder. Uh, and the user just doesn't even have to think about this. I, this is not my favorite way of doing this, but it, it is possible. And of course, any HTTPS host uh, you can push content to, really, right? So for example, you could push content to IPFS and fetch it from IPFS gateways, right? Boom. Uh, again, you can rely on, on the infrastructure of, of IPFS uh, to, uh, to fetch your content, right? OK, uh, so. Um, uh, multiple alternative endpoints can be configured at the same time, right? So you can have a configuration that says, look, if the original domain is down, you can fetch it from here, 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 or here, right? And then a random, every, every, uh, every request, a random alternative endpoint is, is selected to pull content from. And several can be used simultaneously. So you can have an N out of M situation of saying, like, I have five configured, try two of them randomly just in case one of them will be down, right? So you're, uh, you're making more requests, but you're also maximizing the chance that even if one of the alternative endpoints is down, the user will still get, uh, get the content. Uh, this is probably the question that you have in your heads right now. Uh, what about, like, OK, but those endpoints have access to your content. They can modify this content. They can be malicious, right? Oh, no, what do we do about this? Uh, Subresource integrity to the rescue. Anyone here is familiar with subresource integrity? OK, so what subresource integrity does is uh, you have a, some kind of a resource, let's say a script that you're pulling from, let's say, Fastly, because that's what it was made for. It was made for those large CDNs. And 
the, you, you, you use the link, but you also add the, in, the integrity hash. So in HTML, it's just like, you know, uh, script, you know, uh, uh, ref, uh, blah, 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 and then integrity equals there's a hash. And the browser, what the browser does, is it pulls the content, verifies the hash before giving the content back to the, to the uh, client side, right? Uh, which means if you have the hash of all the content, uh, you don't have to care because if somebody is maliciously modifying the, the, the stuff on the alternative endpoints, your browser will just say, nope, sorry, the hash doesn't match, uh, bye-bye, right? Um, but this, again, uh, so, but in HTML, we can only set integrity attributes on script and link elements. Thankfully, uh, in JavaScript, we can set integrity hashes on any request. And because, uh, because we're doing this in, in JavaScript, because it's a service worker, blah, 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 all of this, we can set integrity hashes on every request. So I tested this with video, I tested this with images, I tested this with all sorts of content, and the browser just happily says, okay, I'm pulling some content, hash matches, great, here you are, or hash doesn't match, well, screw off, right? Um, and yes, there's, a, there's already a plugin for this in, in, in LibResilient, so that, that's already implemented. But then, that's not that easy, right? But then how can you distribute integrity hashes safely without having to trust alternative endpoint operators? Right? Because you have to, the, 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 the service worker has to get those hashes somehow. It can either have them pre-configured, which is boring because now you cannot push new content, or it can, ha it can pull them, for example, from those alternative endpoints, but we don't trust those alternative endpoints. That is the whole point of distributing those hashes. What do we do? What do we do? Asymmetric crypto. Um, uh, right? We can, another plugin already implemented, uh, verifying uh, fetched content using signed integrity data. Right? So what happens is is initial setup of your website, you generate private and public key pair on your server side, uh, you configure the public, key, the public key in libresilience config, and you use the signed integrity plugin. And the signed integrity plugin, during publishing, what you do is you publish, you generate the integrity hash of every piece of content, image, whatever you're publishing. Uh, you put it in a Java web token, magic, 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 uh, signed with the private key generated before, and you put the J, uh, JWT uh, in a file available under whatever the URI of the original content is, dot integrity, right? And this is, what, this is what this plugin expects when it's working in the service worker on the client side. When it's fetching content, let's say it's fetching uh, favicon.ico, right? What it will do first, it will fetch favicon.ico.integrity, verify the signature, get the hash out of it, verify, pull the, pull the favicon.ico, verify the hash, boom, uh, it works or, or it doesn't work, right? So what this means is we, have a, we can have content delivery even in our, if the original website is down, thanks to service workers. Uh, we can verify the fetched content uh, has not been tampered with thanks, uh, thanks to Subressor's integrity and the signed integrity plugin. And it all works on regular browsers, no special settings necessary. If you are using any of the you know, modern browsers, all of this already works. All, all, the, all the plumbing is already there, right? So what we can have exactly this. Imagine 10 organizations that say, okay, we're going to deploy LibResilient on all our websites, and we're going to serve as alternative endpoints for each other, right? You have a community CDN where no new infrastructure needs to be deployed. The only cost is, uh, is storage space, right? Because each of those websites has to be mirrored on each of those uh, organizations' uh, infrastructures. That's, that's the only thing. Uh, the, the bandwidth costs kick in only uh, when one of the websites is down, right? Because with this config, it's like, does the website work? It works, here's your content. If it doesn't work, well, alter alternative endpoints, right? Other orgs' infrastructures pooling, right? You don't have to trust them that much, right? Because you, can, you, you are pushing the content along with the integrity files, so the service worker will verify this, right? So you don't even have to trust those organizations like, to not modify your content. You, you only have to trust them in the sense that uh, they will not maliciously screw, screw you up in the sense of like, deleting content or anything like that. But if it's a group of, of organizations doing similar things, perhaps that's not an, an entirely unreasonable assumption. Um, and it is completely transparent for visitors, right? So everything I promised, there you go, on this black screen that has nothing on it. Um, 
So yeah, a group of organizations running its own, uh, their own hosting infrastructure, serving as alternative endpoints for, for one another. Oof, uh, I think I have about five minutes right now. So, and I have, I think, three slides. This is doable. Uh, not mentioned here. Uh, configuration changes during downtime, right? Let's say your website is down and you decided, ah, you, I have to change alternative endpoints. Some of those organizations also went down or now don't want, to, don't want to deal with me. I set up new alternative endpoints. What do I do? How do I tell the users who have already loaded the service worker uh, that there are new alternative endpoints? Well, if at least one alternative endpoint already configured works, you just push a config update. Boom. And this goes through the same plumbing as any other request because it's just config.json file. So config.json, config.json.integrity, boom, any user who has uh, visited your website before has the service worker loaded. And uh, as long as at least one of the alternative endpoints works already, pulls in the update uh, and, and boom, has access to the new uh, alternative endpoints or, or the new uh, config. Um, the, the, uh, I have not talked about deployment and publishing pipeline uh, because that depends very much on the setup of each website. If you're using a static site, there is going to be a bash script, a makefile, a GitLab CI CD pipeline, or something like that that pushes content to your site. Well, we can just add some steps that pushes this content to IPFS or your friendly organizations or your whatever Google Drive and, uh, you know, at the same time and, and calculates the integrity files uh, along, uh, along with that. Um, there is a uh, FAQ. Can you read the link there? There's going to be a more visible link uh, at the end. Uh, current status of LibResilient, code exists, works, and has uh, decent code, code, uh, code test coverage. Um, uh, all of the plugins that, uh, that I was talking about today have 90% uh, or more uh, test coverage, so uh, yay. Uh, documentation largely exists, but definitely needs improvements. Uh, if somebody wants to read through this and tell me, oh no, I don't understand how this works, this is weird, then I'm very happy to hear that and improve because when I write this documentation, I'm all in my head. I understand all of this. I don't know which things might be completely weird or, or, or surprising. Uh, this has not yet been deployed in production on any large site, but I, have, uh, I, know, that, uh, I know of two reasonably large projects that are uh, testing it and might, might deploy it at some point. But testing, improvements, ideas, criticism, all of this is very welcome. Please you know, come at me. Um, and uh, the project got a small grant from NLNet, which I highly recommend. Those guys are also at MCH, and you should find them somewhere there. Uh, somewhere there, sorry. Uh, and they have more money for interesting projects. So you also should you know, try, uh, try, uh, try uh, with your project if you have a project. Possible next steps, uh, WordPress plugin. Because why would WordPress not, why should WordPress not be able to, uh, to push stuff, you know, along with integrity files and all of this to some places uh, that make sense. Uh, reverse proxies can be alternative endpoints. I haven't used them. I prefer the static approach. I prefer the approach of here's content files because this decouples the alternative endpoints from your backend server. Uh, meaning if you're using reverse proxies, if your backend server is down, your reverse proxies are probably also down or unless they do some interesting caching, right? Uh, but this is do totally do doable. And totally crazy ideas, and this is almost the last slide, uh, why not use IPNS and IPFS as, co as content transfer directly in the browser? Well, there's a bug with IPNS, and I could, I could rant about this over beer uh, because it hasn't been fixed for three years. Uh, but once they fix this bug, we might be able to just use IPNS, IPFS directly without hitting uh, IPFS gateways as oof, alternative endpoints. Um, we could use, I want to test WebTorrent as content, uh, content transport. Again, not alternative endpoints, just a completely alternative transport uh, plugin that just pulls stuff from, from uh, the cloud. Um, and uh, merge requests are welcome. And other sta non standard, decentralized, weird, uh, fascinating transport plugins. I'm all ears if anybody wants to talk to me about this and, and figure out things to do together. And the website is resilient.is. Uh, there's a blog, there's documentation, there's code. It's a very simple website. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, questions? <laughs> Oof, I made it. Wow. You still, you, you still had... You still had... You still had one minute. Awesome. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I could have spoken a tiny bit slower then. <laughs> yes. yes. We have a fast, but understandable. All right, we have questions. A microphone in the front, please. 
Um, any ideas about first-time visitors, like how to solve this problem for first-time visitors? No. Uh, uh, no, but my, again, from my experience of running these kinds of websites, uh, most of the visitors are, first time, are, are, are returning visitors, usually, right? And, uh, and so I, I found a way to solve this problem. I haven't found a way of solving the, the first visitor's problem because you have to load this code somehow, right? Uh, I would love... To, f to have a way of... Um, okay, so let's say you have a static website. Let's say you have a static website with relative links. That means you can just zip it. <laughs> you can literally just distribute s zips on, on, on uh, thumb drives on a sneaker net, right? I would love to have a way of distributing this code with the zip and saying, hey, if, you're, if, you're, if you receive this zip to, the zip file to uh, uh, um, uh, experience this website, click this, and now you can go online and it will just pull stuff. But that's not how this works. Unfortunately, service workers can only be installed either from localhost or from HTTPS endpoints. And, and so if I find a way to you know, go around this uh, such that I can install a service worker in a user's browser from a zip file, then awesome, right? But yeah, that's, that's a very, very valid question. So this will also break uh, if we finally teach people to clear uh, the browser cache and browser profiles. I, I think we don't have to worry about that. I don't think they will ever learn. Yeah. But yes, uh, this, is, this also used to not work in Firefox private mode uh, or incognito mode or whatever they call it this week. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think they, they enabled it, right? So yes, there will be browsers and there will be configurations uh, where this will not work for users. Uh, I usually use my, most of my browsers with JavaScript completely disabled, so that would not work for me. But also people who have JavaScript mostly disabled, also probably have Tor. So yes, on your Tor sites, uh, on your like, hidden services, please. Yes. First, thanks for the, for the talks. And I didn't get one thing. So the idea is that uh, a group of organization uh, stay together and install and configure LibResilient to, uh, and so to have kind of many island where yeah. many different group of organizations can back up each other. So, yes, so each website, yeah, let's say you have 10 websites, right? Each website has LibResilient configured and has, okay, this is my main site, but all of the other uh, website, like infrastructure of all the other organizations. This is clear. Is, yeah. Uh, the, the question is, uh, do the organization have to find each other uh, somewhere? I mean, uh, if I want to Mm -hmm. Install LibreResilient. How can I find some other okay. organization that want to right. pair with me? So that's that's uh, uh, so LibreResilient itself uh, is just install it on your uh, uh, on your website, and you have to figure out where your alternative endpoints are and where you're pushing your code and all of this. Right? This is up to the website admin to figure out what they can rely on as far as the alternative endpoints are concerned. Right? Uh, but what I what I realized after I wrote most of this, this code is, okay, but if we have a group of organizations, they can rely on each other, right? They can, they can pool their resources together using LibResilient in a way that I don't think was possible before, or I have not seen this kind of, this kind of resource pooling, which does not require either a separate entity or, or, or some kind of TLS private keys sharing situation or, or anything like that, right? So that's, that's the, I think, the, the innovative part of, of, of the talk, right? But yes, for, for LibResilient itself, you just have to figure out your alternative endpoints yourself. I'm going to be a bit anti-HTTP because I think it tends to reinvent wheels all the time. Most other protocols use SRV records for this purpose. Um, and I know the HTTP workgroup in the ITF is working on a different record specifically for HTTP, which also allows you to prioritize where, where you come from and even segments of your website can be uh, separately redirected. Yeah. So that, that, might, that will be a, a general solution that might even be uh, might even end up in browsers. Uh, inshallah, uh, but it's not there yet. Uh, there are things yeah. like alt SVC. Anyone can define SV records. Yeah, yeah. But the browsers will have to read them and, and, and to apply them, right? Uh, and it will still have to be specified such that it works kind of like uh, HSTS, which is like, these are the alternative endpoints. Uh, cache this information for the next whatever. Uh, and also, this solution, uh, those, those headers, you will not be able 
uh, to update the, in the configuration on the visitor browser uh, unless your website is up, right? Because you're not getting those headers, as far as I understand. Uh, your DNS infrastructure needs to be up. That's Sorry? all. Your DNS infrastructure needs to be open, yeah, not your but, website. Yeah, yeah, uh, but uh, what I've, well, sorry, yes, you're right. But what I've, what I've seen is something called uh, Alt-SVC. Uh, I can't remember what the acronym is for, and that's an HTTP header uh, that specifies alternative endpoints kind of sort of, sort of thing. Uh, and, and this could potentially be a solution like, like this, but again, you would not be able to update the visitor's uh, config uh, um, when your website is down, right? With the, with the DNS, I agree, right? But also with the DNS, if your, D, uh, if your website is blocked, then DNS is probably blocked, right? And this doesn't rely on DNS, right? Because you've loaded the service worker, the service worker has all the information it needs uh, already, right? Okay, uh, any more questions? Wow, clearly a boring talk. Uh, so there's another problem. Uh, mm -hmm. If one of the organizations in the circle gets compromised, suddenly you have one organization that can push like malicious, malicious content uh, to that gets hosted by everyone else. No, it cannot. Well, it can it can push this content. Uh, yes, right. But I would imagine that if you're running an organization that is part of this pool, you would have a domain for your own stuff, websites, etc., and you would have a separate domain. Uh, for the for the alternative endpoint stuff, right? Uh, in this in this pool, right? So, of course, if I were running infrastructure an infrastructure of one of those organizations, I would separate those things very well, right? Because I don't know what's going to get pushed into this, right? But from the perspective of a uh, of a website operator who's relying on those alternative endpoints, the sub resource integrity and signed integrity just solve this problem because if somebody pushes the you know, modified malicious whatever code to their alternative endpoint that you're going to use, uh, it will, they will not be able to uh, sign the integrity package, right? So, so you, the, the service workers will say, oh, that was some kind of a bug, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but there, there are some types of content that gets, uh, you can get a website down uh, like a uh, police raid just uh, by the presence of the files. Oh yeah, but, but that's, why, that's why I use the word community, right? That yeah. you have to have a community of, of organizations and then uh, you, you have to trust each other a little bit, right? It's not a completely trustless. Uh, and I will CDN. save you now. Yay! Um, <laughs> so please, um, as we are at the end of the time for oh. this talk, please, please give our speaker another very co cool round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have stickers. If anybody wants stickers, I have stickers.